Today is June 27th, 2013, and I'm Mark Madison at the National Conservation Training Center in Shepherdstown, West Virginia, and we are here with Robert Michael Pyle, who has come out for a return visit to the Student Climate and Conservation Congress. He just addressed uh, about 110 uh, high school students who are interested in pursuing environmental careers. Uh, so, Bob, the first obvious question for you is uh, what message did you give the students? Oh, I thought you were going to ask me what message the students gave me. That's far more important. <laughs> Maybe both. <laughs> <laughs> oh, if I, uh, I, I barely presume to give any messages, mm -hmm. but, but if there's anything I could convey to the students, I hope it was uh, my respect and gratitude for their hopefulness and for the fact that they're not jaded and they're not... Uh, spoiled and they're and they're hopeful. They're genuinely hopeful, which we are too. But you know, after nearly half a century working in conservation, it gets tough sometimes. As we thought we were going to fix it in the '60s and '70s, and we didn't. Although things improved, and we got m wonderful federal laws out of that time, and that was all very encouraging. But then, of course, there have been the the downturns and the very perilous, parlous, and, and baleful situation we find ourselves in. So it's easy to get cynical, and we know friends who have, but the kids aren't. They're not cynical, and I love that. So I hope that the main message I may have given them to, was to reinforce that and reinforce that there are biological, ethical, poetical, and perceptual reasons for their hope. Their hope is not founded on clay. The second thing was to please put down the handhelds for a significant period every day and engage, not to put those devices down, but to literally put them down and engage with the physical details of the actual earth because it's so easy to divert ourselves from that. And it's not just young people with handhelds. Everybody does that with a, a sit-down computer or a job or anything else. Even books, which I venerate. Mm -hmm. you got to get a nose out of a book from time to time and go out of doors and to touch things and smell things and engage personally. Become a better naturalist every day and because if you care about conservation, you need to know something about the actual natural history of the physical components of the earth. You've written about this a lot, yeah. Bob, and, and, and you were one of the first to, to, to alert us to what's now sometimes called nature deficit disorder or more eloquently extinction of experience. <laughs> well, I think, I think they both have their eloquence. They're yeah. both lucky terms. Uh, extinction of experience arose for me when I was trying to prepare a lecture in the stead of my professor at Yale, Charles Remington. He was supposed to give a talk at AAAS, American Association for the Advancement of Science meeting in Boston, on wildlife in the year 2001. <laughs> And that was in 1975. And he said, will you please go give this lecture for me? I was a graduate student of his. Said, what am I going to talk about? Well, I'll talk about the very first butterfly extinction that I witnessed where my own school was built on top of my own favorite butterfly habitat. And, uh, and when I was trying to come up with how I would convey that, that term slipped into my mind. A great piece of luck because it's lyrical, it's, it's, uh, it sings, it scans, and it says exactly what it needs to the extinction of experience. It's been a great pleasure of mine to see that term enter the, the uh, lexicon. You Google it and it'll come up a lot, and sometimes, lots of times, it's, it's, uh, it is, in fact, uh, attributed. And that's gratifying, of course. But it's almost more gratifying when it's not attributed because it means it's kind of come into the thinking. So that was a lucky thing. Nature Deficit Disorder, Richard Liu will tell you that, that uh, I think it was Kathy, wasn't it, his wife, who came up with that term? And, his, and, he, and it was his editor who insisted they use it. So there's a piece of double luck. Yeah. It's like when Nabokov threw out the manuscript of Lolita, uh, with whom I've had a couple of magnificent conversations with some of these students about it. They're uh, them bringing it up and reading it, and I was so thrilled that they had and saw the environmental implications of it. But that astonishingly important book, one of the most moral treatments of human um, enormity in our time was tossed in the trash can by Nabokov because he was sure it would be misperceived as pornography, which of course it was, but his wife knew what it was and how powerful and important it was, pulled it out of the trash can. That's another one of those pieces of that luck. So we have luck, and uh, we live in a stochastic universe, which means stuff happens contingently, and when we're on the right side of that, because we're aware of the possibilities, some nice things happen. And so I wouldn't say that extinction of experience or nature deficit disorder uh, one is more eloquent than the other, and in fact, they are more complementary than they are synonymous. 
they, they kind of, uh, they absolutely go hand in hand. It's been a really sweet commensalism to see uh, the Children and Nature Network and the Green Schools Alliance and the Natural Leaders Programs and all the things that have come out of Richard's book, basically, right. and that Richard says that Thunder Tree, my book, in which I spatiated the extinction of experience, had a certain amount of, of inspiration for him. That's all the community of conservation. And that's what NCTC is about. It's the community of conservation. I think of this place as the capital village of the community of conservation. Great. Very quickly, um, you said we need to get kids out in nature and so on. I've seen a lot of students come up talking to you. It's yeah, been great to have you here for the, the whole week. And, and, and just kind part. of an in-house sage or Lorax <laughs> <laughs> for the week. And, uh, the Oracle of Grace. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so what do, you, what do you tell them? How do you... Uh, well, that's my favorite part. When they do approach me, I, I, I try to be available. And, uh, but I especially love it when they come up with a question or a comment based on the talk I gave about uh, butterflies and climate or, or anything else they're thinking. First of all, I'm flattered that they think I might know the answer. And, uh, and we have, I try to have a conversation about it rather than a didactic. Uh, we had a wonderful conversation late last night. I felt bad because a couple of the, several of the young women stayed up till nearly midnight talking in the lounge of Murray about evolution mm-hmm. and about um, the, the, how butterflies convey that. The other day in my talk, I was asked, why are butterflies significant to me? And I said, well, there are lots of reasons. They're elegant indicators of ecosystem health, as we've shown. Uh, they are uh, fun to yeah. study, and they were fun as a kid to chase, and they still are. And they are elegant and beautiful. You don't need anything more. But there is one more um, uh, trait that they have that, that kicked off this conversation late last yeah. night. And that is that the, the, the young woman was asking me about crypsis and and. Uh, and uh, camouflage and how that arises. So we got into natural selection. And I said, the other thing about butterflies that I should have mentioned to that question, to that young man, so I hope he listens to this, <laughs> is that butterflies are, the wings of butterflies are canvases of evolution. More than probably any other organisms. Not more. They respond just like other organisms, but they advertise it. They proclaim their adaptations through natural selection on these amazing canvases that are their wings that are painted with the pixels of scales. They're pixelated images. That's exactly what they are, long before we managed to do that on a screen. And that's one thing I often say about nature deficit disorder is that, is that uh, these are wonderful devices, but the shimmering pixels on a, on a silicon screen will never match the shimmering pixels on a butterfly's wing. You know, a direct experience. So anyway, um, when natural selection acts upon mutations of butterflies and makes them more fit for the circumstances that they confront in life, it is reflected and expressed directly, not metaphorically, not um, figuratively, and not uh, opaquely, but directly and nakedly and openly and brilliantly on their wings. So the wings of butterflies are one of the most marvelous windows on the world and windows into evolution. So that's one of the conversations I've had now with three or four groups of the students yeah. who are interested in one aspect or another. Also, the other thing I've been saying to the students a lot, uh, we talked about our river trip yesterday. Mm-hmm. And there were so many wonderful experiences. I love, we're sitting here in the archive at NCTC and there are some wonderful canoes and watercraft in here. <laughs> Probably were used for fell purposes of the mass, mass hunting with the giant guns. And the, but uh, we were in canoes on the Potomac and I always love canoeing a new stretch of river for me anywhere. But uh, my favorite thing of the whole day was seeing some of those students in their solo kayaks or doubles and even a, a triple canoe or two get off on their own, away from their own pack. The pack stuff's fun, and I love watching that too. But when they got off into the shallows, into the edges, under those sycamore boughs, imagining themselves lying on that sycamore bough, reading or writing or listening to music or just listening to the wood thrushes, I hope. Um, And they got off on their own, and they got to be quiet. There's not always a lot of quiet time in a busy young person's life, uh, social life. So that was thrilling. And then to see some of them walking through the paths here at NCTC, and actually without prompting, I did prompt often. Uh, I'd say, "Hey, hey, you guys, check that out. That's so and so, the wood thrush, especially." But to see some of them actually discover the wood thrush on their own because it was so ethereally beautiful, they might not have known what it was, but they'd stop 
and listen. So our, our contacts have been both information rich in both directions. I always want to know where these kids are, what contacts they come out of, and what their take is on things. And it's always thrilling to me to see how they have come to conservation and where they hope to go with it. Talk about giving us hope. Talk about rejuvenation. It's the best thing about coming here. That's why you, you and Steve stay so young here, I think, because <laughs> I know there are a lot of mature fish and wildlife and other agency people that come through here. But you have young people through here a lot, too. Okay. And that is simply rejuvenating. Well, that's a good one to go out on. I think uh, so. Thank you so much. We've been speaking with Robert Michael Pyle. He's an author, lepidopterist, and this week, inspiration to 110 high school students. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. Thanks for having me again. I'll be back again. This is, I think, my sixth visit here, probably. We'll keep working on that. Let's do it. <laughs> All right.